Well, Jim, we love Helix Sleep, but let's get off that mattress and let's wake up and let's listen to some exciting audio from oh, AEW's boy. Wrestle Dream post show media scrum. Wait a minute, let me get my hot cocoa and my little nightcap with the furry ball on the end of it on because this will put you to sleep if anything will. For the record, I have two coffees on my desk right now in anticipation of this, but it was a lot of interesting things and we'll break it up and we'll play different segments and talk about what you think about this. Let's start at the beginning. Tony Khan opening up with Adam Copeland. Let's hear it for the newest member of the AEW roster, Mr. Adam Copeland. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for having me. So, so what's new? <laughs> Sorry, I went for the obvious. This is going to be excellent. Well, I'd like to begin uh, by <laughs> welcoming Adam to AEW. And I thought it was a great show tonight. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight great. at AEW Wrestle Dream. Uh, it was an amazing event. Thanks to all of you. And I'd like to announce Adam Copeland has officially signed with AEW. Yeah. Congrats on being all elite. And something I'm really excited about, uh, something that I think is going to set this apart, and uh, something that got me even more excited uh, about Adam being here is this is full time. Adam's going to be with us every week. He's going to wrestle. He's a full time part of the AEW roster. I think it's going to be a long time since anybody's seen Adam Copeland wrestle uh, as much in it and at the level he's been in AEW. He's already been doing great stuff. He's wrestling at the highest level in recent years, but he's going to be here on a weekly basis. And it's something I'm so excited about because that's great news for us in AEW. It's great. Let me stop it there. We heard a great and excellent and amazing. Yeah, an amazing. He could have said that in a quarter of the words that he used and just turn it over to the guy that everybody's waiting to hear talk. He needs to get on the decaf, possibly a Xanax before the scrum. I'll give Tony credit. He's wearing a suit again. So he's dressing up. His hair is still a mess and he looks like he hasn't shaved or slept in days. And he's also wearing Antonio Inoki's red scarf. Oh boy. For effect. But what do you think about it? Did his he knock the picture of Antonio Inoki over at the ceremony? Somebody said he was, I, I saw a clip of him where he went to try to hug the Japanese people who looked at him like he was a fucking space parasite. But I didn't see him knock over the picture of Antonio Inoki off the table in the ring when he was klutzing around. I didn't see the ceremony. Was that on the pre-show? It was on the pre-show. Yeah, the pre-show was as long as most pay-per-views, apparently. I have to see this. Any interaction with Tony and other human beings in public is always really fun to watch. But let's hear some of the words from Adam Copeland, some of the first words. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I, um, part of coming here is that I wanted to contribute. Um, I, uh, I wanted to help. And I just felt like here I'd really be able to do that and have the opportunity to do that. And I look at an entire fresh roster of faces and, and so many talent that I've never laid hands on before. And that, that to me, as a person who is uh, driven by challenges, that for me was the biggest thing. Like I've never been in a ring with Samoa Joe. I've never stood in a ring with Sting before tonight. After 31 years in the industry, that's never happened. Um, and then I see a guy like Nick Wayne or I see Swerve. There's, there's just so many possibilities here. And for me at this stage of my career, that is so enticing. That is so exciting. That is so, uh, you know, I, I said it out there <clears throat> after the fact, when I came back out there tonight, I felt free. Let's pause it there for a second. What do you think of those comments? Well, do you understand where he's coming from? Yes, I do. And, and also when he said, I think I can contribute, I think I can help. I just flash back to the last guy that thought that who just got fired for front face lock and one of those young fucking fresh faced puppies that he thought he could help. Never forget how and, happy Tony Khan and CM Punk were at those first press conferences together. It was well, just like I'm, this. That's the thing. And I'm not knocking edge here. I'm wondering if he thinks that he is. Yes, he can have all these fresh matches. That's a different thing. But as far as helping contribute, you can't contribute anything if nobody wants to take it. So is it going to be that, is it going to be the, uh, the hangnail page there? Well, I don't really listen to advice. We, you know, we've done so great on our own. Or is it going to be the, the buckaroos, geez, he's getting over us. Here's another one. We got to put a stop to this or it, it, whatever it may be. How receptive is the 
audience for his help going to be is what I'm worried about. Or is he, he's going to have plenty of fresh matchups. I don't know if I'd go to Edge versus Nick Wayne real quick. I think he can, and, I think he can contribute like someone like Nick Wayne for instance. I don't know anything about him, but he's a little different I see than like some of these guys that when AEW started were just complete indie guys that didn't want to hear from anyone cuz they thought their shit would get over and it didn't. Or, yes, but it this can't be you know the guy just coming to do charity on the air. It's still a business. Let and Edge versus Sting, well that might be attractive except the combined age is 110 or whatever. Let's concentrate on Edge, I, I keep saying Edge, Adam Copeland versus MJF. Adam Copeland versus Twinkle Toes would mean something for that audience. The main event fucking guys, don't put him in there with Moxley. He doesn't deserve that. Yeah, you but do. The main, the main names of the company and not Jericho, where the, there's the combined age of 106, it would be the guys that are still uh, that are on top and can still go and need a little extra boost up rather than the elderly or the completely green as chlorophyll just because it would be a good match they've got another star now they got another name let's not fucking make him one of the boys and let's not Make him half of the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions go ahead I'm sorry I'm droning well that's all right let's go back to some audio right here I, I, that's just the word that that pop, like I, I felt free and it felt fun and I felt almost like the same feeling I would have when I'd, I'd come out for my indie shows you know back when I was either Adam Impact or Sexton Hardcastle or something and it was this brand new thing that I always wanted to do and 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 that feeling I felt it out there tonight and that at this stage of my career to feel that that's special that's uh mm -hmm. Man, like, come on, 31 years in and to feel that way, that, that's a gift. And this is all I ever wanted to do. And this feels like an opportunity to come in and not just come in every three months. Like, I can be there every week. You know, I'm a, I'm a full-time guy. And uh, I want to do that for as long as that is possible because I feel like that's how I can help the most. And um, more than anything, that's, that's what I'm here to do. Like you said before, very similar to CM Punk's comments when he first came in. The excitement, the feeling of freedom, which I yeah. guess just means not having Vince or Paul or Bruce or Kevin Dunn or any of these people telling you anything. You could do whatever you want. You can understand why he would feel excited by that. Yes, I do. I'm not sure. It was unintentional comedy. I'm not sure I would have phrased it. I felt like coming out in AEW, I felt like coming out at an indie show. That, you know... Well... Some people, that's a good connotation. Other people, it's not. Um, but this, again, may be part of the problem that he's going to find out about. He doesn't have anybody telling him what to do. But unfortunately, nobody else has anybody telling him what to do either. And then if people start telling him what to do, which ones are they supposed to listen to? Is he going to be a producer and an agent? Well, they make suggestions. They don't give instructions. We've heard about that and seen that in action. So I'm just wondering if he's 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 happy to be back with Christian and, and a number of his friends, but I'm wondering if he's fully grasped that... Does Edge even know at this point that you can't give all the boys the freedom to do all their creative shit or you end up with what AEW looks like now. You know, AEW has a lot of problems. I don't know if Edge will be the solution. You could hope, if you're an optimist, that Edge will do something to make things somewhat better, at least in his segments. But again, this is what we were saying about Punk a couple of years ago. At least his segments will be good. But uh, let's go back to Edge. Some more comments. Edge and Tony Khan. Or excuse me, not Edge. Adam Copeland. The Cope. It's great news. And uh, in, in even more great news, uh, we're going to hear from Adam Copeland, the rated R superstar, for the first time ever on AEW Dynamite this Wednesday night. Perfect way to begin a new era and to celebrate the fourth anniversary of AEW Dynamite. So I'm Perfect way to begin a new era. Have everyone's DVR go on the fritz. And yeah. <laughs> and bring in your biggest star. Good idea. And, well, he should have said, don't tune in AEW Dynamite. Tune in 
right after AEW Dynamite at 10 o'clock Eastern because that's when Adam Copeland's actually going to go on because of all of our technical difficulties. Not only did the DVR listing on many of the major cable systems had AEW live at 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern Wednesday night, but because they had technical problems in the broadcast and played one of the shitting, shittiest, meaningless interviews ever twice so people could hear it, which was a detriment, that put Adam Copeland over the edge of 10 o'clock and anybody whose DVR was set properly for 8 to 10, it's, they still didn't see it. Well, it's done, it's done well on YouTube, but let's go back to Tony and Adam. I'm really excited to have you uh, this Wednesday in Stockton on Dynamite for the first time ever. Yeah, I'll give the mission statement uh, and kind of uh, explain uh, what happened tonight and, um, and what my thought process was there because there was a, a lot of different things going on emotionally out there tonight. Um, hey, Keith. How you doing? Good to see you. It's been a while. Um, Keith Elliott Greenberg. He gets everywhere. No. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, man, like if you can't tell, I, I'm pretty excited and I feel like a little kid again. And uh, this is the best gig in the world. It, it really is. Yeah, I'm a kid from Southern Ontario and this is all I ever wanted to do. And if you had told me that 98% of what would happen to me throughout my career would happen, I'd say, you're crazy. Well, throw this onto the list and at the top of the list now, because my God, it just, uh, man, I just, I can't tell you how excited and and even just... So I'll tell you a story. Uh, Friday, I fly here Friday, right? And uh, I call Darby. And I'm like, hey, Darby, you're a Seattle guy, right? So I want to get a muscle car. And do you got any cool what? sites that we could shoot? So we just went and gorilla shot Friday night from like nine to midnight. And I'm hanging out of the back of an SUV, holding the cameraman while this muscle car is going 50 miles an hour down gum alley. Was it gum alley with all the gum? It was just <laughs> disgusting and awesome at the same time. And I'm just like, I'm hanging out of an SUV holding the cameraman and I'm just cackling at 49 years old. Like, this is amazing. What, what are we doing? This is awesome. And again, back to that word, just free. All right, let me stop it there. There's a little bit of insight in how that video, the video that surprisingly played when Darby was being beat up to show Edge driving down the road to come save him, that's how it was made. Oh, boy. Uh, well, first of all, Gum Alley. Apparently, I've been to Seattle. Nobody ever mentioned that to me. I missed one of the... They've got all the gum, apparently. One of the uh, big tourist attractions there. But, um... <sighs> Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And I understand he wants to have fun. I know he's not mentioning the however many millions of dollars that Tony has offered him to do this full-time once a week, by the way. Full-time is now. I'm going to be here every week. Well, he could do Collision, too. We don't know. Oh, come on. We don't know. Frank Sinatra could do a fucking local goddamn telethon for uterus repair, too, but I don't. No, if you need to fucking spread the stars that thin. What channel's that telethon on? That'll be on, on channel BR549. Um, I'm glad he's happy, and I'm glad he's getting to work with people he likes, and I'm glad if they've annoyed him uh, up at the other place or, you know, made him feel unwanted that he's somewhere that he can feel wanted, I'm afraid that the enthusiasm is going to wane when he sees what a shit show that the whole operation is and that one person is not going to be able to stop this unless they're named Tony Khan or Shad Khan. And also, who does he want to get in the ring with over there when he had to retire for X number of years with a bad neck? I'm just, are we going to Ray see... Phoenix. That's what I was going to say. Are we going to see Felix picking him up and dumping him on his head a couple of times in a row? Or are they going to treat him with the respect and deference that a major star with a bad neck deserves? Or do they know how to do that? That's why he's got another reason you got to be careful who he works with. I'd, lo I'm, I'd love to see Edge against Christian. That'll be fabulous. Edge against 
pockets may be a different matter. Who knows what's going to happen here? I don't. Adam. I don't know how. Against Adam, I don't know. Edge against Adam. No, no, Edge is Adam. You can't call him no, Edge, Edge anymore. Edge is Adam. Well, he's one step closer to the Edge, and he's about to break. Should he have changed his name to Cliff? <laughs> And then he could do the the promos. You're headed for the cliff, baby. I don't, I'm just... Um, you know, these promo videos, I remember saying it to you years ago when AEW first started. It would be one thing if you said, as a promotion, we want to let the audience know that we're giving each top wrestler a filmmaker that will work with them on crafting their vision for what they want to present to the audience. That's one thing. But I understand why guys like making these videos. I understand why he liked hanging out with Darby at Gum Alley. Why MJF and Adam Cole liked hanging out on the water with the Big Show. It makes them happy. But what function do these videos really serve other than making the actual wrestler filming them happy? Well, they could serve a purpose, but sometimes not in the context that they're presented. Remember before the first primetime special on TBS back in 1986 for Crockett? They wanted to make Magnum look like a, a TV star, like he did anyway, standing there. And they shot him riding his motorcycle with his leather jacket through down through the streets of Atlanta and into the Omni. And I think there were even some fans there to cheer as he pulled up. And then he went into the fucking building or whatever, and then they went into the open of the show. It's a cool thing, the big baby face, motorcycle riding, leather jacket wearing, fucking Tom Selleck looking motherfucker is riding through the streets of Atlanta on his motorcycle. It wasn't to come and save Dusty from the horseman. It, it was just, it was a personality piece. And it was shown right. on the television program to give him more personality, but he wasn't, it didn't come up on the screen when the horsemen are kicking the shit out of Dusty that Magnum has to drive from fucking Northwest Peachtree Street down it with a camera on him and get all of his glory yeah. to come and save his fucking best friend. With a camera on his head, a camera behind him, a camera to the left, every kind of yeah. view you can get of this rescue. No, that's the context. Just showing him doing that in his private life like he really does it is, is fine and is great and gives you added dimension. But driving a video driving down the street while they're kicking the shit out of your fucking boy? Fuck your video. Just get out there. All right, well, uh, let's go back to the Cope, Adam Copeland. Diarrhea. It's great. Did he That's just amazing. say diarrhea? And, uh, uh, let I, me I rewind a second. It. I believe he may have said verbal diarrhea, but let's double check that. I want to make sure we get this right. This is awesome. And again, back to that word, just free. Sorry, verbal diarrhea. It's great. That's Anecdotally. And, and then Tony says it's great. It's great. It's Sorry, great verbal, verbal diarrhea. diarrhea. It's great. Thanks, Adam. I have it all the time. I recommend it to you. <laughs> Let's go back to Mr. Verbal Diarrhea himself, Tony Khan. And uh, I, I love seeing you like this. I'm so glad you're happy to be here. And you're jumping right into the fire. Not <laughs> only are you uh, going to be making your first ever appearance on Dynamite this Wednesday, but then the following week, uh, first of all, you're also coming to Collision, I believe, in Utah no. yes. on the 7th. So he's working both shows this week. We're going to see uh, Adam Copeland, the Rated R Superstar, Wednesday night, Dynamite in Stockton for the first time ever. And we'll see him for the first time ever on Collision this Saturday. And then the following week, Dynamite is actually going to be on Tuesday, October 10th, for Title Tuesday. It's my birthday. It's going to be a great event. We're going to have a great time. Great, great I'm very time. excited great about event. it. And I got the greatest birthday present great. in the world because the newest member of the AEW roster, the Rated R superstar, Mr. Adam Copeland, has requested a match on October 10th in Kansas City. And uh, we got Bulldog a little Bob preview Brown. of that action tonight on Wrestle Dream. Based on your request, it's going to be Adam Copeland, the Rated R superstar, versus Luchasaurus. On Tuesday, October 10th, in Kansas City, and Luchasaurus is... Wait, he said it was title Tuesday. What title is that match for? The fucking dinosaur title. Right? There's no title. Why call it title Tuesday if there isn't a title in every match? Well, because it's titled Tuesday. What's well, his birthday, too. 
See that? He didn't say Title Tuesday. He said Title Tuesday. That's what they're going to call it. Tuesday. It's a new marketing campaign. Is a multiple-time champion, one of the toughest wrestlers in AEW. It's going to be a great debut match for you. It, it, it'll be hard. Um, <laughs> hey, what do you think of them going back and forth between kayfabe and not in kayfabe in this? I mean, obviously, when they're talking about his feelings and everything coming in there, there's elements of truth in there. When they're talking about it being a hard match against Luchasaurus... Although oh, maybe, I believe that too. Then maybe it's, it's a truth to be like too. pulling teeth. Is it, Edge is going to get his dentistry degree because get a good match out of the fucking lizard without getting dropped on your head in some fashion, the big fucking bastard. He's okay with the job guys and he's great backup for Christian, but on his own in a competitive match, I would be afraid. I'd treat Edge like a Fabergé egg. I get, but yeah, it is going to be a hard match. He's going to get kicked in the head. That's my money. I'm putting my money on Luchasaurus accidentally kicks Edge right in the head. I th I think he'll err on the other side, and all his shit will whiff by a foot and a half because he's going to be petrified. See the dinosaur petrified? See what I did there? All right, ten bucks. You want? Well, now you didn't say we were going to put actual money up. Big money, ten bucks. All right. All right. You say he knocks Edge out, I say he whiffs everything. With like 10 bucks, I can buy like a thousand shares of Podcast One. Hold on, let's go back to the audio here. Tony and Adam Copeland. But I I've, uh, I will say Luchasaurus is a guy that I always saw and uh, saw so much potential in, in what he brings to the table. Um, it's also kind of jumping into the deep end of the pool, but that's that's what I do. So great. And, uh, and we can take some questions, Mandy, if you want to. You know, that's the weird dynamic. I believe Edge is genuinely excited and everything, but I also believe he laughed a little too hard at Tony's comments before. It's like when you're sitting next to the boss, there's a weird yeah. dynamic there where it's not completely genuine, especially because it's Tony. But let's go. When, when, when everybody wants to look at the boss like he's got a mouthful of steam and turds, that's the problem. Yeah, again, no one has said anything about money. Why are you here? Oh, Tony offered me much more money than they would even consider. That's not even being said. All right, thank we you. We get one from both of you. Okay, great. <laughs> um, lyrics went monthly, Pierre. So, so compared to a lot of your other peers um, from your generation, you spent most of your career in one company. Yep. So now that you're in AEW, what are one or two of those bucket list items that you're looking to accomplish, whether it's an opponent or a match type? What's something that you're really excited to do? You know, when I talked to Tony, I said, just in looking at the roster very quickly, like there's 14 names. I mean, that's just from a quick little cursory glance. But like I said, I mean, I've never faced Samoa Joe. That's really exciting to me. I've never faced or been in the same ring as John Moxley. Oh, Highly interesting to me. Claudio, never been in the ring. Like it, there's so many different talent here that I have a lot of respect for. And I'd really like to, to feel what that is. Um, Kenny Omega, like that's never happened. I just met him. We'd never met before, you know, um, there, there's a lot here, um, to see and to, to challenge myself with. And again, that's my entire life has been built on challenges. So, to, to look at that, oh, God, a guy like me, that's just, that's a steak dinner waiting to be eaten. You know, there's a lot of similarities, actually, between this and Jericho jumping to AEW, you know, before AEW was really a thing, in that it seems apparent WWE saw them one way and wanted to work them down the card or hold them yeah. in place while they elevated other people. And these guys are willing to invest on themselves and give this a shot. again millions and millions and millions of dollars more than they would get from wwe but still it's a big chance and wwe does not i mean it's what wwe did to hogan in 93 technically you know they were going to work him down the card put yeah. him in a tag team with brutus beefcake so what, what do you think of that just the idea that you know beyond leaving wwe this is also leaving wwe's way of seeing you well, the thing is, you can't blame them, the WWE being them. In the case of Hogan, they did want to move him down because it had been 10 years. And he would have never meant 
Hogan would have never meant in WWF again what he meant in WCW and then going back to WWF. How can we miss you if you won't go away? A different look and a different environment. I don't know that Edge is at the point now where he's going to invigorate his career by going to AEW for a couple of years and then going back. I think this is, you know, because he's older now than Hogan was then, right? In 93. I mean, he's older now than... I mean, Flair was this age at the end of the 90s. I mean, it's crazy when you really yeah. try to put in perspective the age of 49 in wrestling now, how it's a shrug. And maybe a long time ago it was, but for a couple of decades there, your career was going down by that point. He's 49. Well, it, we may be getting off topic here, but in the territories you could always stay fresh. And as long as you weren't injured or so old that you just couldn't do anything, you could go from place to place and stay much longer. When it became national, then there was the problem with guys right. staying so long and being in the public eye in the same audience so long. And that's, you know, what led to sameness and malaise. And now there's a million fucking people, but they haven't made any stars in 20 years. so. The older guys that are late 40s, early 50s, whatever now are still names much larger than many of the younger guys. How old was Johnny Valentine in the plane crush? He, Johnny Valentine, was either the same age as Edge or a year older. And he was still one of the biggest stars in the business. Yeah. And again, kept it fresh. He had just come to the Mid-Atlantic a few years earlier and it changed yeah. everything. How old was Wrestling 2 in 84 when you worked with him? Um, Johnny Walker had to be in his mid fifties at that point. And again, he was wearing a mask. So even though he looked old with the mask on, you didn't even get to see how old he truly looked. Well, that's the thing is that Johnny Walker, because he went bald and just had that face had looked old when he was young. And then when he put the mask on, the body never really changed. You couldn't tell. Well, let's go back to Edge talking to the wrestling media. I don't know how I feel about the wrestling media or whoever was giving him a standing ovation or an applause when he came uh, into yeah. the room and <laughs> announced that he signed a contract. That's not really the media's job, but let's go to that, this. That's, that's part of what they, they have to do that to get admission to the room. Go ahead. Emily May with Sports Heater Wrestling. Hi. So everyone was so excited, the fan reaction to have you debut tonight. And what I would love to know is how did these conversations begin and what can we look forward to, not only perhaps in ring, but also will you be helping out backstage perhaps in developing AW talent or creating storylines? Um, storylines. I've always been a person that enjoys that process in terms of being heavily involved in the creative process and the direction of storylines, helping add little things, but those little things, when you put them together, they start to weigh a lot. Um, I love that. I love detail, um, attention to detail and, and just the little nuances. I, I love that. I, you know, I watch movies and I just, uh, Oh, why'd they make that choice? I used to follow directors around and they'd be so annoyed. I'm like, why are you making that choice? Why are we turning around here? Why are we getting this angle? I'd go to the DOP, go, well, what's going on here? What's going on with this lighting? I'm just fascinated. Um, it's part of why I fell in love with this industry uh, is the storytelling element of it. You know, it, it, it's a form of art and that's how I've always looked at it. And now it's an even more nuanced form of art uh, because it's such more, it's so much more detailed and the audience is so much more intelligent. So you have to work to that intelligence <laughs> and I let me stop it there. That's a very interesting comment. The audience is so much more intelligent. You have to work towards the intelligence. If you're just talking about how smart they are to the wrestling business, what do you think of that? Well, yeah, that's the, the problem there is they have a bunch of smart marks asking them smart questions and they're booking their business for the only fans they have, which are smart marks. They don't care what the normal people think because the, the normal people, there is no attention to detail. None of this shit makes any sense. That's what we're, t we are now normal people, Brian, because we watched wrestling when it was for normal people and had to make sense. And you didn't have to appeal to the smart fans who were 
verklempt because the fucking buggy whip armed fucking 170 pound guy that could do the great drop kick wouldn't get used getting used over the fucking star that sold the tickets and now none of this shit makes sense to a normal person so the attention to detail that he is wanting to bring i don't know if they know how to fucking do that over there because they're not in any way trying to make this real, which was the overriding directive of pro wrestling for 100 years. That's why everything mostly made sense if you could control it and people understood it and wanted to go see it. Now it's for the learned marks, the intelligent wrestling marks that just want to see goddamn a choreographed, synchronized floor routine performed flawlessly, and that to them is seven stars. And meanwhile, none of this shit looks fucking real to the to the average person, or you can't get caught up in it because they're all fucking trying to be actors and dramatic fucking performers instead of goddamn wrestlers mad at each other wanting to fucking fight. There's the problem absolutely plan to be helping out whoever wants help whoever comes and talks to me i am an open book um in my 31 years of experience if you want to tap into that i am always i'm a phone call i'm a text i'm a come talk to me face to face away that's always been how i've been um so uh, you know there, there were guys like i had a group of seven people and i'd facetime with them an hour a day to help them find their voice in promos i love doing that stuff um so that what do you think of that he has a facetime group with seven different people and he spends an hour a day with them teaching them how to do promos i'd like to know who they are and and to see if they because they probably have been helped edge can talk he's he's not only done promos for all those years but he's done the acting roles where you do pick up some things that you can apply to wrestling he was talking about production aspects. It's always good to ask questions like that. That's what MJF was doing in MLW, even. Why well, I knew he was going to be uh, a, a force to be reckoned with. So I'd like to know, but eh, nothing wrong with that. But eh, I think that the person that needs to go be reading Edge's open book and talk to him on a regular basis and FaceTime or whatever with him is Tony. Because it all revolves around Tony. If you hire the greatest Shakespearean actor in the world and you give him a movie script or a play script written by a goddamn eighth grader, how good can it be? So I love that Edge wants to work with the young guys if they'll take the advice and criticism. And if he can figure out a way to work it into the show, Will he be as demanding as Punk was? Will he say, we don't do that shit on a show I'm on because I don't want to look stupid? Or will he just be, well, I'll give these guys suggestions and I'll worry about my segment and Tony's right in the show, so it's going to be what it's going to be. There is the question. I don't think anyone is as... Um... Demanding? Well, punk doesn't necessarily have the tact that other people will try to use to try you to You don't need maneuver. tact in wrestling. I'm not saying you do. I'm saying everyone else tries to pussyfoot around things. You need tact, maybe at church, or maybe at the grocery store so it doesn't erupt into a goddamn free-for-all. There is no tact in wrestling. There's do this, like this. And if you do it good and make it better, I'm going to put you in a main event. If you don't do it like I say and it looks like shit, I'm going to fire you. That's not tactful. That's just common sense. That's part of what I think I bring to the table when, when I come here. And, uh, and honestly, that, that was one of the things, one of the really pivotal things beside my daughter telling me that I should go be with Uncle Jay and have fun, um, that... I thought I could really try and help here. And in turn, that helps the entire wrestling industry, which is the thing that I just love. Uh, second behind my, my wife and my kids. You know, that's what I worry about. CM Punk went in there with the same thoughts. He was going to help people. It was going to be fun. And he came out of it richer. 
But in terms of reputation, in terms of frustration, in terms of everything else, he came out of it for the worse. It wasn't fun. You know, that's the one thing. He has that first day excitement. You know, Soraya had a big pop that first night. Miro had a big pop his first, you know, everyone does. Hopefully they can sustain it, at least his excitement. It's nice to see him this excited. And you hope- Well, the, the good thing is they can't, you can, Edge, Adam Copeland can't just disappear for weeks at a time. They have to feature him and Tony's acknowledged that. So it's not like they'll, you know, just put him in the deep freeze like they have other people. And, you know, Tony brought up earlier how great this was. This is amazing. This is great. This is, I think he also said it was awesome. And we have a way you could deliver a box of awesome to yourself. Well, someone else will deliver it. You can order it. You can receive and enjoy a box of awesome today. You, Isn't that right, you, Jim? You, you can receive it. You can purchase it. You can spend not very much money on it. You can't deliver it to yourself. That'll be taken care of. But if you want awesome in your box, well, boy, it's going to be. Imagine that. Imagine in these trying times, you've got something to look forward to every month. That's when the mailman or the delivery person comes up to your door, beats on it with a club, and when you open the door, throws this box right in your face. And it's a box of awesome. Courtesy of our friends at boxofawesome.com. I just got my newest one. Did you get it? What was in it? Uh, hold on, I have it right here. This is from, this is Stealth. It is a sideliner pocket knife from Bear and Son Cutlery. Or Cutlery. Cut, cutl color, cutlery? Cutlery, excuse me. This is actually a beautiful knife and it handles really well in the hand. This is a really nice knife. It handles very nice in the hand. You've gotten a lot of knives from... Box of Awesome. Should we be concerned about you? Let's move on here. It also has the Ultimate 7 you, in You said one. It's, it's the Slash the slash Kit? It is the Stealth Kit. Again, maybe you stealth have too many kit. knives. Well, no, there's a Slash Kit. The knife in the Slash Box is made by Bare Bones, based in Salt Lake City. Oh, that's a different company. No, and I also got here the Ultimate 7-in-1 Tool Pen from Jack Zaguri Designs. This is actually really cool. There's a bunch of things I could do with this. And finally a money clip, and a key capsule from Craig Hill. One word, Craig Hill. Money clip, I can think of a few things you can do with that. What, a key capsule? Do you, you put your keys in that and then take it like a, uh, like a pill? What? A key capsule? I don't think that's what it is. What is a key capsule? A key capsule is, uh, let me open this. It's a capsule. How do I open this? Do I need scissors? <laughs> Hold on, oh, no, here we go, hold, oh, here we go, here we go. You don't mean the actual, you're opening the packaging now. This is the the opening of the box of awesome. Well, I opened the box already, I'm opening the key capsule. It's a little capsule you could put, I don't know if my key would fit in here, but you could hide other things in here, or you could place other things in here. You could, <laughs> wait a and minute. keep it on yourself if you need to uh, have things that you have uh, put in a covert location handy. Ah! And it, it, is it, uh, is, does this stand up to the pressure of body cavity searches, I wonder? This secretive thing that you've got there? Well, it is like a little plug. I don't know. Depends where you put it. A little plug. Well, I'll give you a little plug because everything that comes from boxofawesome.com, or at least 90% of it, is from a small and up-and-coming brand. They're supporting small businesses, and they've got a great variety. You don't have to just be Jack the Ripper to want to get a box of awesome. They've got all kinds of things. They've got uh, the Damascus steel knife by Buck and Bear Knives in Pennsylvania and the gut hook knife in the trail box made by Titan International located in Illinois. But they've got the American barbecue rub in the carnivore box from the Great American Spice Company in Rockford, Michigan. They've got the multi-tool from SOG, a company with deep roots in the U.S. military. And they've got hot sauces from small brands all over the country, Texas, Nevada, California. They've got the cask package, which is a barrels handcrafted from American white oak. They've been charred to create a smokier <laughs> cocktail. What's the name of that one? American white oak. No, what's the name of the package? Oh, the cask. The cask. Oh, cask. C-A-S-K. I thought you said the cast package. I have that package already. It's where your money disappears. Yeah, no. That, that, we've, we've got his package, too, in our grip right now. 
<laughs> um, they've got hand-blown Italian crystal glass. They've got amazing things. Uh, the Weekender bag that we got, metal hardware, reinforced frame, quality leather straps. You don't know. There could be anything in these boxes. All you got to do is go to boxofawesome.com and take a little quiz what you're interested in. If you're not interested in knives, they don't want to send you 15 knives. But they've got camping gear essentials, cozy threads, everything from the best small brand. They're teeny weeny little brands. Sometimes you need a microscope to see them, but they do good stuff. They're regular sized and they are just maybe small companies producing great stuff. Either that or it's a bunch of midgets that have gone into business for themselves. This and pen, regardless of what. This pen is so cool. Listen to this. It's a ballpoint pen, a touchscreen stylus, a spirit level, so you can, you know, level things if you're hanging them on the wall, inches and centimeter rulers, Phillips head and flathead screwdriver. This is a really nice pen. And this knife, this is one of the nicest knives. Does it come with a death ray? No, but, you know, there's always next month. Well, there you go. So there's always, ne if you don't get your death ray this month, you might get it next month, folks, because right now you go to boxofawesome.com and enter the code JCE at checkout and get 20% off your first box. 20% off your first box at boxofawesome.com with the code JCE. How can you beat that? Because already you're only paying a fraction of the price the box is worth. Then you get 20% off. Now, if you're, say, you're only paying 30% of what the thing is worth, and then you get 20% off of that, now you're down to 10%. Well, if you add in 5% for shipping and 7% for insurance, then you're at 22%. And that is below the federally mandated percentage that, uh, that you have to pay before you consider that you've got a good deal because the good deal bar is now set at 28%. What? I hope I've made myself clear. I have no idea what you just said. Well, that's why you just got to go to boxofawesome.com and enter the code JCE at checkout for 20% off and wait and see what comes to you. That's right. Box of Awesome. I have to say, this is maybe the most awesome box I've gotten from them. So this knife is one of the... Baron Son is the name of the company. All right. And if you do see Brian last out on the street, stay far away from him, especially if he's got his hands in his pockets. I'll slice you up. I'll cut you from asshole to appetite. I'll cut you three ways, long, wide, deep, and repeatedly. That's four. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Metaphorically speaking. Box of awesome. Dot com. Code JCE. Well, let's go uh, back to uh, the end of the awesome Adam Copeland. That could have been a nickname for him. Talking to Keith Elliott Greenberg here. We can do a few more, I think. Yeah, I'm on a roll. Yeah, he's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again. Hello uh, again. Keith, Keith Elliott Greenberg with Inside the Ropes magazine. You mentioned that you were here Friday night. Now, there's a lot of people in this room who I think, had there been an Adam Copeland sighting, they would not have been able to contain themselves from tweeting about it. How did you manage to keep yourself scarce? <laughs> oh, man, I was sequestered. I, I sequestered myself in a hotel room. Um, so we're, we're, I mean, we were in some sketchy neighborhoods, like Darby took us to some, some sketchy places. It was like, ain't nobody here going to worry about like Adam Copeland being here kind of thing. Right. So, um, nobody saw us. And then I, uh, I went to my hotel room and I just like sneak out to get food. And this one kid, bless his heart. I'm at this burger joint and I just really wanted a cheeseburger. Cause I hadn't eaten for 14 hours and I was like, I just, I just want to get a cheeseburger. So I'm in there. Is he stealing your bit? He's stealing my gimmick. And I'm sitting there, I'm reading my book. Cause I bring a book, book everywhere when I eat. And I looked up and he went, oh. I went Shh. okay. Okay. And that was it. That was the, the only time that I had that encounter. Cause the rest of the time I was like, you know, put in all that. So, um, so yeah, that's what, that's what happened. I was out in Redmond. See, that that sounds like sloppy K Fabin to me. What do you mean? Going in and sitting and eating in a burger place in the town in which you're making a surprise. Now, Brian, who besides me has done more surprise entrances into a promotion where nobody knew it ahead of time? Did it in WCW in 93 and the WWF in 93? ECW in 97. 
Did it in ECW in 97? Did it Ring of Honor in fucking 2000? And what was that? Nine. No, you... And you love cheeseburgers, so what do you do? I go to the drive-thru. What if he didn't have a car? Why wouldn't he have a fucking car? He's a grown adult man. Someone drives him to the hotel. He's going to stay and sequester himself in the hotel. He's not going to leave. I don't I know don't, why he's not I calling ne- room service. I never or trusted DoorDash. anybody. I did my own fucking travel arrangements. I got to the town myself. I picked my own hotel and I went my own way and I didn't fucking goddamn uh, uh, have myself seen in broad daylight on the streets. And when I got to the building hours early, in the case of WCW, um, in 93, me and, and uh, Stan and, and Tom and Bobby Eaton hid in a closet or a janitor's room of some description in center stage. I was at the hotel next door to the Manhattan Center in Ring of Honor in the WWF. Me and the bodies flew rented our car and drove to Alexandria Bay, New York and showed up at the goddamn building way before fans were hanging around. There's ways to do it, but you can't just be going out willy nilly and shooting muscle car videos and going to get cheeseburgers and sitting down and eating for heaven's sake. Well, again, the video is one thing if it's late at night or overnight and it's in you know, skid row. There's a chance you can get away skid with that. Skid row. Now, we're not talking about them. And besides that, Flop Dollar just got fired. But when you're hungry and you want a hamburger or a cheeseburger and you're in your hotel and you're not supposed to see anyone, he went to the place and someone saw him. At least one person he knows saw him. Yes. Do you even worry about, like, the person delivering the food? If you're going to order room service or if you're going to order from, you know, nowadays DoorDash or Uber Eats or something? Are you worried that that person will recognize you and go out and tweet something? That may very well happen. That's why I'm saying you go to the drive-thru, keep your head down. Limited interaction. Hi, my name's Amanda from WrestleTalk.com. Oh, come on! (laughs) Fine, thank you. How are you? What's your problem? What the fuck is she, six? Well, she's from WrestleTalk.com. She just has they a very... They have children now that work for their their uh, organization that they're asking questions. That is, isn't that past her bedtime anyway, this media scrum? It's got to be one in the morning. Well, again, it's on the West Coast, but maybe she just has a high-pitched voice. Let's go back to her question. <laughs> you sound excited. I am. <laughs> um, so I've been authorized to ask this question. Um, I'm not asking anything about contracts or anything of the like, but my favorite version of Adam Copeland is when he's with his lovely wife. Is there any chance that we might see you together here? Or is that something that you'd like to do in the future again? I, I mean, any- let me stop it there. That is really interesting just because this is a unique situation where a husband and a wife both have pre-existing relationships with WWE. That could create yeah, some I'm, issues, right? I'm still, I'm still going back to the questioner there and, and thinking, you know, who's next? Is it going to be Diane Sawyer or Barbara Walters after this incisive journalist question? But that's one of the reasons why I was questioning whether Edge would want to pull the trigger on going and doing this or not, because it's not just him. It's him and his wife that have had this 20-year relationship with the WWE. They're still highly in in the the mix as far as Beth just worked, what, last year, doing the thing with Edge. They've got opportunities for legends, deals, appearances. I don't know whether she's in the Hall of Fame or not. And so it had to be not only millions of dollars, but it had to be in case anything happens to AEW. Nobody said how long the contract is that Adam signed. Is it's a year, two years, three years? He had to get the money guaranteed from Tony's father. If if AEW is not around, I still get this money because he's excommunicating himself and Beth from the company for however long, and potentially with the new owners. This is the <laughs> they buy the company, and he says, "Fuck it, I'm gone," and I'm on the other channel a week later. Are they going to be as easy to deal with as it might have been when the AEW thing's over in whatever fashion and Edge might want to come back and do something in the way of appearances or something to do with 
the wrestling industry at the, and get paid a lot of money for that. That's why I'm saying I didn't, I don't know whether a guy that it, both he and his wife have been with the company for so long wanted to make that move just for a year or two and maybe piss him off for the rest of existence. But that's just me. Anytime I get to, to be close to Beth, obviously I'm going to, you know, be pretty, like super excited about that. I, I don't know about the possibilities of that in the foreseeable. Um, but I, you know, I just, I love being around her obviously. Um, and, uh, and, and we've had a blast when we did get to work together. Um, but where she will be uh, instrumental without anyone knowing it is she's my sounding board. So if you've seen me do something or you see something that you think worked, it was always bounced off Beth. And then she always gives me better ideas back. Um, it's kind of amazing to be married to a Hall of Famer. She went to OVW. Cool. Who can suplex you? Well, of course she did. <laughs> Good training. That's why, that's why her ideas are so much better. Um, and yeah, and that's a, and I know a lot of people are going to say, "Oh, Cornette, you've told the WWF to piss off before, and you quit WCW and blah blah blah." Well, at that point, to be quite perfectly honest, they were not paying me millions of dollars a year to fucking show up part time, and I didn't have to fucking. <laughs> Edge was not having to sit in a room or a car with shit stain and Vince McMahon on a regular basis. And he's making a lot of money to work a day a week, maybe. Well, so you, I you mean, do know what it's like though, to walk out because you're not happy with creatively what they are doing with you and what they're going to do with you. I mean, when you left Oli in 1990, yeah. I mean, you had no, you didn't have any faith in them at that point at all. So you left and right. again, you're a bit more vocal than edge would be in a situation but I, like that. But I was, I wasn't making millions. I was making 150 grand and I was having to work every goddamn day and be around these people all the fucking time. Well, that's a good point. And that was the audio we're going to play from edge. He was also asked about his theme song mentioned. He has a pre-existing relationship with the band so he could use that song wherever he goes. The next person to come into the room, Jim was MJF. But the first thing he did apparently was a reply to this tweet here. I have a tweet here that was sent on October 1st by Brian Alvarez. <clears throat> Max wins the handicap match, a gimmick from start to finish, but the fans ate it up, particularly when he hit the big body slam hold prior to the finish. So again, I'm reading that just to give you some context going into MJF here. Let's well, and, and I was about to say that's, pretty much a brief description of what happened let's go to this and as i said we were off to a great start and it started with an amazing tag team title defense from a great champion here he is jewish ultimo dragon Hold on. yeah way too many belts <laughs> oh. jewish ultimo dragon <laughs> okay that's what i'm doing with them that's cool. okay um right off the whip i just wanted to say something very quick very quickly um Let's have a conversation. Uh, you said that the match was incredible, but it was a gimmick match. And I would like to, no, 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 I didn't tell you to speak. Uh, very quickly, <laughs> here's what I'm going to say. I feel professional wrestling for an incredibly long time went south, in my opinion. I think people decided that they needed to absolutely murder themselves or their opponents, not even considering trying to get a win. All they were considering was trying to get a cheap pop or a cheap reaction. Uh, what I'm trying to do is bring back a flavor of ice cream that I love and dare I say is just as much professional wrestling as most certainly is not a gimmick. And that is to make people so emotionally invested in the person that is inside the squared circle that if they hit a body slam or a headlock takeover or a kangaroo kick, it gets just as loud of a reaction as Darby Allen getting thrown onto the steel stairs, which was the most insane thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I am not faulting you. You're a good man, Charlie Brown. All I am simply saying is nothing I do is a gimmick. Um, I believe that professional wrestling in all shapes and sizes is important and it's all different flavors of ice cream. But I also believe to me, from my two cents, if you can do what I do and get that reaction, I think it's much harder actually than doing a triple indie, whatever the fuck. Obviously they're gonna clap, it's insane. 
uh, can you make them absolutely freak out and have a damn near panic attack when you do little to nothing? To me, that is professional wrestling. And everybody's thoughts on what pro wrestling is is different. And I am really, 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 really proud of all the flavors of ice cream that we showed on tonight's card. I think this... Well, let me stop it there for a second because yeah. he hit some big points there. Well, and let me jump in. And apparently this is the, I don't know, the the reason why the generations can't speak. Because apparently Alvarez was saying it was a gimmick from start to finish, like that was a bad thing. And MJF feels the need to defend what he did. No! I said that was a pretty much a brief description of what it was, because it was, and I would have said the same thing, and that's a good thing! If I'd have said that, it would have been comp, which I did. It was complimenting it. I hated the booking that Tony's such a fucking imbecile that he puts the most talented guy on the roster and his world heavyweight champion in a goddamn situation where he has to have a handicap match with two job guys for a fucking secondary tag team title belt. And the whole reason why they've got those belts is that it was working with him and Adam Cole, and now Cole has crippled himself again. But MJF is the only smart motherfucker on the roster because he worked a match telling the people what they wanted to see and then making them want to see it and then giving it to them. That is wrestling. MJF's exactly right. The fact that it wasn't two main event guys and it wasn't a match that drew any fucking money whatsoever is not MJF's fault. It's Tony's fault. But that's the weirdness that that MJF feels the need that he has to apologize for having really the only match on the show that did exactly what it was supposed to fucking do. And that Alvarez thinks that it being a gimmick match was bad. Ugh. You know, it all goes back to what is pro wrestling when you're a kid and you're first told by someone on the schoolyard or your dad or whatever that it's fake you're led to believe that they work together and don't hurt each other, but they get injuries in what they're doing. Now they hurt each other. Yes. <laughs> now they hurt each other. And the comparison he brought up, he didn't even bring up like a Young Bucks flipping or Ray Phoenix flopping, whatever it may be. Darby getting thrown onto those stairs, which looked brutal. Yeah, because it was. And again, MJF got the people to go crazy for a body slam. And the kangaroo kick is stupid as I think it is. And I don't like it. And I wish he didn't do it. The fans are popping for it. He's doing, he looks like he's in good shape here at this press scrum. <laughs> Barely any sweat on him. Everyone else is coming out there beat up. It's because people are into him and not just waiting to see him do a goddamn cool move. This is quite possibly one of, if not the best pay-per-views we've ever done. And what's absolutely insane is, first of all, beyond proud that I get to say that I'm the AEW world champion, there's no grandest prize in the sport, but to be able to say that and be the top dog when this roster is, quite frankly, an embarrassment of riches is insane. Um, it is He's using insane too much. That's like five times. Yeah, well, and also now we've switched over into, apparently I need to keep Tony Khan happy because I'm sitting pretty good right now and uh, I'm not going to do anything to piss him off. Was well, he also speaking the way the babyface world champion should be speaking next to the boss? <sighs> yeah, I guess. But at the same point, he's hurting his credibility. when He blazed. Oh, this is one of the greatest pay-per-views ever. And we've got so much talent. You got a lot of guys. Ain't a lot of talent. He said an embarrassment of riches. Should he have stopped that embarrassment? That's what I was going to say. But it was, the line was so obvious. I figured I, I won't even go there. It's, it was absolutely insane. The amount of. Just in, listen, uh, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm a company guy, but what I will say is I'm, I'm a pro wrestler um, and I care about pro wrestling uh, and I'm definitely pro wrestlers first kind of guy. And I feel like AEW as a locker room has never been healthier, never been better, never been more talented, never been more driven and never been more hungry. And like I said, I'm proud to be a leader of that. Awesome. All right, we'll stop. Awesome. With, we'll stop. With, awesome. 
Tony's endorsement there of uh, what MJF had to say. We're going to move on from MJF because he's babyface MJF, so he's not cursing at the media anymore. I was about to say, this, it used to be the, the highlight of the thing, and now he's being nice, and it's not any fun. What do you think of him in the role, though? Despite the fact that we miss him as the heel MJF, and we're not talking about the comedy segments or anything, just him talking straight like this, because it's a different way we've heard him speak publicly. What do you think? Well, it's kind of what he has to do now with the position he's been put in. And unfortunately, because of the the nature of AEW, he was always from the start going to, the fans were always going to turn him babyface eventually because he was the best promo and the most intriguing personality. And we talked about it a couple years ago when they were trying to force him to be a babyface way before its time. You know, he he was natural because he was the best at what he did at that particular thing. Now, you know, I guess it's got to be that way, but we will... In, the problem is when a guy gets over, the only reason that MJF is over now as a, the top babyface is because he was the top heel. And as long as they have the same audience, which it doesn't look like that's going to change, then they will remember the heel MJF and he'll still stay over as a babyface. But if you were to get new fans now who had not seen any of the MJF heel stuff, they would wonder, and he wouldn't have as, as impactful, I don't think, a, 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 an impact on those people because his babyfaceness is based on him being your, our scumbag now, rather than a scumbag. And the people are, well, why, he's the devil? Should we? It's confusing if you don't know the backstory. So I think for the next year or so, he'll be fine. And then by the time that, since they'll probably not get any new fans anyway because of their product. But if they do get new fans, by the time that people start murmuring about MJF, well, we don't really get why he's such a smart-ass babyface. He's going to be in the WWE making twice as much money anyway, and he'll be a the heel. goddamn biggest star there, and he'll be a heel. He will, he will definitely be a heel when he goes to the WWE. They're not insane or jealous, either one. Do you think MJF's being used well right now? Are you out of your mind? He's the world champion doing phony comedy videos and buddy comedies and defending a secondary tag team title in the opening match on a pay-per-view. Who's his money opponent? Punk left. Joe is apparently settled. Jay White. Danielson's been done. Yeah, like I said, who's his money opponent? He's about to wrestle Jay White. Who's his money opponent? Who's the main event of the pay-per-view? How is the, the, the next hot program for the world title going to play out? Somebody needs to go ahead and fucking set fire to Adam Cole and get some heat with MJF so we can get something started. Because the, the thing is now, whatever they were going to do with the tag team, they can't do it now. And yes, it was over. But how over is it going to be if we continue to see MJF saying, don't worry, Adam, while he's sitting in a wheelchair, I'll make sure we have these belts in six or nine months when you're back from all these surgeries. It's over. Figure, refigure it. Shit happens. Get out of it. Unfortunately, I think that's in a lot of ways the story of MJF's career. A lot of things that seem to be about to happen, shit changed real quick, like the stuff with Punk and All Out. You're about yeah. to work Punk and MJF. That all had to change, but we'll see what happens. Perhaps, Jim, watching this, listening to this, maybe you could watch this, but listen to an old MJF promo <laughs> or an old MJF media scrum appearance using your Raycon earbuds. What you're saying is you just want to listen to what you want to listen to rather than what we have to listen to in the course of our employment here. And that you, you need to set your own soundtrack. That's what you need to do. You need to listen to the things that you want to listen to when you want to listen to them. And the perfect way to do that, as you mentioned, is with the Raycon wireless earbuds. And did you know, Brian, 
that Raycon is celebrating an anniversary. They are six years old, and that's 42 years in human years. So in very the very short period of time of only six years, they've made a name for themselves in the premium audio space. You know where that space is, don't you, Brian? The that's premium? right in the premium audio space. No, I don't know. It's right in the holes in your ears. Oh. That's where the everyday earbuds are not just everyday, but they're special because they deliver high quality audio and thoughtful features like a 32 hour battery life and a perfect in ear fit for all day wear and lasting comfort at half the price of other premium audio brands. And yeah, again, let's say, for example, you're walking down the street and you're listening to your favorite tunes. But suddenly you see a bread truck bearing down on you. Well, you can hit the button because they got the awareness mode. So you can hear the horn right before you get run over. No, you're not going to get run over. Why, why are you walking in the middle of the road? Where there's well, a I don't truck? know, but Raycon can't babysit you. If you're going to walk well, down the middle of a busy street, they can't do anything about it. Don't do that, ladies and gentlemen. Don't do that. Stay on the sidewalk or maybe the grass if there is no sidewalk, but... Yeah, go touch some grass. Awareness mode would help you in other situations that are not life-threatening. Well, people love to be aware of things. That's right. And, and these let's are say, for example, earbuds. yeah, if you're walking by, you know, down Wall Street, you punch the awareness mode, and suddenly you're aware of all the stock prices. Nope. It just, Again, it never, it, you've got to be in the vicinity, though. You have to be a half a mile or less from things you want to be aware of. That doesn't exactly work, and you shouldn't expect it to work, ladies and gentlemen, whether you're on Wall Street or Main Street or whatever street it may be, maybe Gum Alley, but the Ray What about the Boulevard of Broken Dreams? Because so many people, have their lives are there littered in the gutter, but Raycon... Is that Hollywood Boulevard? On. Hollywood Boulevard, the yeah. Boulevard of Broken Dreams, Sunset Boulevard, even. Ah. Or possibly, you never know, Blanket Baker Parkway. It could be anything. But Raycon, being six years old, well, they've outlasted all of that because of the quiet. As a matter of fact, they expanded their entire business with the introduction of Raycon Home. So you can buy a home from Raycon. And Raycon Power Tech. They don't have homes. You can buy powerful tech from Raycon. No. And to thank everybody who's shown them support in the past six long, hard years, Raycon is right now offering 20% off everything on the site and select products up to 40% off. Can you remember, Brian, have we ever been able to get a deal for our listeners and viewers and cult members of 40% off? I don't think so. That's extraordinary. That's a large number. Would you like me to do some more math about it? No, I would not. All right. Well, in that case, then, folks, you do the math and decide that you got to save this money. And go right now to buy Raycon. That's B U Y R A Y C O N dot com slash J C E and use the code birthday to get 20 to 40% off site wide. Buy Raycon dot com slash J C E, 20 to 40% off, depending on what you're getting. Use the code birthday because that's what they're having. Six years old. Well, they'll be smoking and drinking in no time over at Raycon. Well, Jim, I don't know how much awareness mode will work as we continue to go through this AEW media scrum. I don't know how much awareness or self-awareness there is from some people in that room. But something a lot of listeners were talking about, Jim, was Christian Cage's appearance at the press scrum. And let's get going with this. It starts right away with him getting a question from Brian Alvarez. I thought they were working together, but a lot of people thought that he was really putting down Alvarez. Let's see what you think. Okay. To the four-year anniversary, and speaking of main events... The winner of tonight's Wrestle Dream main event. Here is the TNT champion, Mr. Christian Cage. Did they turn the applause sign on late? I don't need your lame applause. I know how good I am. Questions for the champion? None. Can I go then? God, Hi, Mark Oak with the Mark Oak Show, him? 101.5 FM, Kate on Las Vegas. Your old friend showed up tonight. What were you thinking? I said this in the last scrum. I don't have any friends other than Luchasaurus. Was it a surprise to see him? Yes. 
Did I care? Not really. It doesn't change anything for me. I'm still the face of TNT. I'm still the TNT champion. I'm still the man to beat in AEW. You understand that, right? That a few short months ago, people were saying this title meant nothing. And I've taken it and I main evented Wrestle Dream tonight with it. I made this title. This title, in my opinion, is more prestigious than the world title, mainly because I carry it. But I think my track record speaks for itself. And I think you have to give me my flowers now. Do you not? All right, let's stop it there for a second. He doesn't talk to Brian Alvarez yet. I, I read the notes wrong. What do you think of Christian? What do you think of his general tone? What do you think? I mean, a lot of people were raving about it, and there's elements of it I really like, but when you've seen a guy talk for 25 years and all of a sudden they're completely different, is that really good or is that just acting? I think, honestly, he's being a professional here, a professional wrestler, because he's being asked after main eventing the pay-per-view and having that long match to stay up until two o'clock in the morning or however long these things go to talk to a bunch of fucking marks. There's no journalists here. It's a bunch of people applauding everybody that comes in and asking, how do you feel about something? What are your feelings on this? So at least he's acting like a God and acting can be acting or just the way you comport yourself, he's acting like a professional wrestler and not coming out there going, oh, I love playing with my friends and we did so many cool videos the night before the show. He sounds like a pro wrestler and a professional athlete and an obnoxious dick and all of those things are good and refreshing in this environment. Well, speaking of obnoxious dicks, let's go back to Christian Cage. <laughs> it's Brian from the Wrestling Observer. Oh when boy. did you uh Great, like talking to marks when did you first see nick wayne wrestle and what were your thoughts when you saw that first match i've never seen wait a minute stop wrestle. it here yep. stop it here oh well i clicked the wrong thing there we go so again uncle dave's mouth organ brian alvarez gets in the room and the first thing he asks is a question about his friend from next county over good old nick wayne instead of anything about the fucking main event between Christian and Darby. Nick Wayne was involved, but let's get the fucking meat of the matter here first. All right, I'm well, sorry. The only thing, though, is if you know the guy is working and there's a difference in tone that we've heard so far between Christian and MJF and Edge, Adam Copeland, not that they weren't saying things that were part of the work in the way they were saying things, but this is a little different. I mean... Again, I don't know why Alvarez is asking this question, but it's not like he can say, so how much is Tony paying you? You're not going to get anything from Christian when he's in this mood or not. not well, mood. he ought to try. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. When you know that the guy's out there doing his, he, he's continuing his thing during the media scrum, what do you feed him? Do you play into it? Should you sit back? What do you do? I would think that he would say, you just nearly killed Darby Allen if he gets out of the hospital and manages to recover from the beating you gave him, do you think he deserves another rematch? Or are you done with him? Are you moving on to greener pastures? Not, hey, and my buddy Nick Wayne. All right, I don't care. Well, let's go back to Christian Cage. Do you wrestle? <laughs> Thank you. Do you wrestle? No. You don't wrestle? I did back in the day. I'm sure you sucked, which is why you're here asking me questions. <laughs> I wrestled his father. But uh, what, you can, did you give a star rating tonight? Did you give me I a really cool give a star, star rating? rating? I did not give a star rating. So what was the question again? I was wondering what you, what you thought when you first saw Nick Wayne wrestle. But you said you never saw him I've wrestle. never seen him wrestle. Okay. Well, thank you. I know he's a good boy, though. He is a good boy. He was a little bit lost. Yeah. But he found his way tonight. And I will guide him to greatness. I will groom him to take over one day everything that's mine. Nick is a fine boy. I see a lot of potential in him. I didn't need to see him wrestle to know how good he is, to know his potential. He's wise beyond his years, young Nick Wayne. All right, let's stop it there. So a lot of fans thought that this was legitimately him 
giving Alvarez shit. I thought it was clearly two guys in different ways working with each other, but there's no personal issue at all. What do you think? No, I I mean, they're working. I think that Christian is working his gimmick. And he wasn't going to give any smart answers because he doesn't believe in that shit, apparently, and good for him. And he's out there doing what he's supposed to be doing. I don't think that he and Alvarez came up with that and wrote it down and said, okay, this is what we're going to perform. I think that Christian just is being a fucking heel and took the question, did what he did with it. I don't think he particularly cares about hurting Alvarez's feelings, but I don't think he was... I don't think that was indicative of uh, Christian hates Alvarez more than the average person that he hates. Well, let's hear more of the heel media scrum work of Christian. Cage, that is. JC from Happy Sports. Christian, you just said that you were going to mold Nick Wayne. Is it more on the other end? Are you brainwashing Nick Wayne? Brainwashing? I'm just telling you. That was a decent question. See that I mean again though that's a question that's kind of feeding into what's happening storyline wise is that what you think yeah. should be happening here Yeah because that's what you're going to get and that's what the issue is and if this is a See here's the thing Tony Khan is setting these whole things up because he likes them and they're fun and he gets to host them Yeah he but likes the he, attention he gets And he them. likes the attention yeah there yeah. is fun and the attention he gets to host it he's here's all my toys out talking to you people because of me whatever they're useless to begin with because all these people in the room are going to cover the goddamn promotion and everything it does regardless of what. So it's to make Tony feel good. But if Christian can go out there and show some people how to fucking do, uh, be a heel or a baby face and stay in gimmick and stay in, in, in within the bounds of the story and what you're doing then at least maybe he's given him an example, but otherwise I think he's probably just pissed off. He has to stay up until two o'clock in the morning instead of going back to the hotel and trying to find some food. Nick knows the truth when he hears it. I'm champion. I'm sitting here as the man in AEW. I'm the most talked about wrestler in this company. Why would Nick Wayne not want my guidance? Do you have an answer for that? You didn't answer my question. He's better without me. You didn't answer my question. You're just telling me an opinion. He's okay. Anybody have an intelligent question? <laughs> See, I got to say, this is like the best work of his career him at, here at this media scrub. He's doing yeah. a good job here. <laughs> See, some people, you can kind of let them do their own thing, and it turns out good. Hi, Omar Q from Real Take Wrestling. Um... It's always interesting to me. Wait, wait, what was it? Omar Q from Real Take Wrestling. Okay. Sorry. Um, it's always interesting to me when wrestlers take apart the uh, mat on the ring um, and expose the wood. What was going through your mind when you decided to do that? I wanted to hurt Darby Allen. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> I thought you said you were going to wrestle him tonight. I did out wrestle him. My hand was raised at the end. I beat him two falls to none. Isn't that the kind of stuff that he would normally do that you said uh, proves he's not a great wrestler? Did I say that? I don't remember saying that. So now Tony's working with him. because And then Tony does... Tony's thing now is he likes to get in there and kind of work with the heel. And then he makes like these wacky facial expressions. Like he's reacting to the thing that he's completely not surprised by. As if he's surprised by it. But that is Tony's real face, though. I'm not saying it's his fake face. Let's go back to Christian's fake face. Questions for the champ. Um, We did see uh, an old friend show up tonight, but I was wondering, as the title holder, do you have your eye set on anybody else as far as a challenger, or are you just waiting for someone to step up next? Why would I target somebody? I have the most prestigious championship in this company. People should be lining up to step in the ring with me. I'm the biggest star in this company. Just being in my presence elevates them. Of course, they're going to line up and challenge me. Well, I'm not challenging anybody. I'm sure that there's a lineup out that door right now. 
What's up, Tony? Well, I think there is a line out the door. You're a great champion. I think it was a great main event, and I think you've proven you're a great champion. It's uh, been a short time you've held the title, uh, a matter of weeks, but in these recent weeks, I think you've uh, proven that... It's going on four months. <laughs> Glad your timelines are in order. Okay. Well, let's have more questions for the champ. Awkward! Yeah, there's a lot of silence, and Christian, I gotta give it to him, he holds the face. He doesn't break. Yeah, because nobody knows how to react to wrestlers actually kayfabing them and being professional. They're like, uh, oh, well, he's not he's not telling the truth. He he's he's trying to do his gimmick. Fuck. Do you think there's an argument for the way that Christian's handling himself here that he's not not to take anything away from MJF, but Christian's kind of he's acting like his belt's the big belt in the company. He should. Who who else is going to get it over if he doesn't? And it hasn't been over. He's actually repairing it now, I think. Yes, and that's part of being a fucking obnoxious heel like Christian is, is you're an egotist. You're you're convinced that you're the greatest and that everybody else is in your basking in your glory and etc. And I, again, I go back to this generation fine. They like to go out and talk to the media, even if the media is a bunch of children with their own wrestling websites. But if you took the major stars of 30 years ago and said, okay, after the goddamn pay-per-view, when you've been beat to hell, then we're going to have you all sit around for two or three hours till two or three o'clock in the morning talking to a bunch of fans that have websites, and we want you to tell the truth to them and speak openly about how much fun you're having working on creative things to do with your friends in the matches. They would have all grabbed their fucking bags and left. Not a soul would have been there. So at least Christian <laughs> is trying to do something to make good of a bad situation by doing something to get him over instead of make the business look like a bunch of fucking romper room fucks. Well, let's get one last question for Christian Cage. TNT champion. Um, Lyric Swin, Monthly Pure. So when you say that AEW needs a father figure, what does that entail? There's a lot of lost souls in this company that need guidance. I feel it's my duty, my civil duty, to make sure that they're guided in the right direction. And Nick Wayne, like I said, he's got a bright, bright future now. Smart boy. I noticed at the beginning of the show tonight, as we did the opening ceremony for the late great Antonio Inoki, I noticed you were watching on at the beginning of the mm -hmm. event. Yep. They lost their grandfather. <laughs> what? He's always watching. I'm always watching. Any Didn't more be... questions for the great champion? <laughs> Anecdotally. It was a classic main event. It was a classic pay-per-view and uh, you've been a huge part of what I think has been the best run of AEW shows we've ever done. Uh, largely thanks to you, sir. You're welcome. All right. Well, it's uh, been a great having the champion here. Let's hear it for the TNT champion, Mr. Christian Cage. <laughs> what did he, somebody knock the coffee pot over? What happened no, there? No, they have a thing where they have the belt displayed on it and Christian knocked it over. And it made a loud crash, like me putting my marimba down. Ah, the marimba again. That's right. Any final thoughts on Christian's appearance here? It, again, you know, it's, it's what kind of what MJF was good at doing when he was a heel, which is actually using this stupid, pointless, waste of time media scrum to get people talking about what you're saying or get your shit over. And everybody else is just going out there, telling the truth. Oh, yeah, it's all phony, and we love doing this to each other. And these guys are, in their own, are trying to do business. So there you go. I'm looking at some of the other appearances during this media scrum. You had MJF, obviously, Chris Jericho, and Kenny Omega together. Mm -hmm. It's easy to go out there when you know you're never going to be asked a question about any of the CM Punk stuff. Then was Christian Cage. Swerve Strickland, Brian Danielson, 
Chris Statlander, Orange Cassidy, and Shibata. How long did this fucking thing go? Darby Allen and Tony then went solo. I'm going to go to two hours and nine minutes in after the pay-per-view event. This is what the promoter's doing for two hours after the pay-per-view event. Let's go to this about Jay Cargill. Hi, Tony. TK from Women's Wrestling Talk. So I spoke to you in Chicago and uh, asked you about Jade. And you're like, you know, whenever she's ready, she can come back. And she came back and she's gone. Now, my question, just, you know, being nosy, did you already know that, you know, this was the game plan? No. I uh, knew Jade's contract had been at a, you know, ticking down. And we were talking about a new contract. And I was very interested in Jade coming back. And we were having a negotiation. And uh, I think it was a, a, I offered, I made a very big offer. And uh, I thought it was a very fair offer. And uh, I think she was considering it. And then she asked for a bigger offer. And then I went up again. And I kind of thought that was going to do it. And then it, it didn't, which I was surprised, because to be honest, I came up to a number that was higher than her original ask. So I don't know what I would have had to do at that point. So I was a little surprised, but I was. Let's stop it there for a second, because that is interesting. So they're in the midst of renegotiations, or, or not renegotiations, negotiations on a new contract. Yeah. And he gave her a figure. He thought it was fair. She declined it, asked for more. He gave her more, and that wasn't enough. I guess the question people are going to wonder is how, not even when did she have her heart set on WWE, but when did she start talking to WWE? Well, the thing is, sometimes you'll ask for something and you'll say, they'll never do this and that you're out because you don't want to do it to begin with. So you ask for something you think they ain't going to give you. Heyman did that with impact, with that celebrated time where they heard that he was talking to Dixie. Oh, TNA. It was still TNA then. Well, at TNA. And he knew that he himself, he couldn't, save the whole company because he wouldn't be in Dixie's position. And so he said, I want a piece of ownership of the company, knowing that was the one thing that she or her parents wouldn't allow her to give or whatever. So he could walk away as the baby face. Well, I, they didn't give me what I asked for. Well, and maybe this backfired on, on Jade because if he kept going up in money and kept going to where it was more than she had asked for to begin with, I think in between what she asked for and and that, either she found out there was a WWE opening or or an open to talk to him, or she was just asking for more than she thought he would go for if he was sane and rational so that she could, well, okay, it didn't work, and go where she was going to go anyway. But we've... <laughs> What was he going to get out of this giant offer, whatever that giant offer was? The way he used her, yes, she, he made her a star. She was undefeated. She beat everybody. She lost two matches out of 73 she's had in her entire career, or whatever it is. And it, 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 she'd done everything. He didn't get a pay-per-view match that was a big draw. He didn't get a house show match. I don't think she did a house shows, did she? Even when they did them. He didn't get... He got a few ratings quarter hours. And what the fuck? That... It was meaningless. She knew that she was never going to be a bigger star or be trained properly or go into movies, major both in pictures and sitcoms. Unless she went to the WWE. And since she had already been in that developmental program or been looked at by the developmental program and they didn't take her, it was Tony being kind enough to give her hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to learn to wrestle and putting her over on his television weekly, constantly, and giving her all the interviews to talk about nothing besides say the word shit to Tony Schiavone to just make her a star so the WWE would want her. And now they're going to fucking bypass developmental and put her on the main television. Even though she still needs training, which she will get in that environment. But it's like, 
he allowed himself to lay down and let people wipe his feet or wipe their feet on him because he had this great idea to make this lovely young lady an undefeated superstar before she'd ever had a fucking match. Well, let's go back to Tony talking about Jay Cargill and the negotiations. So when I did, uh, when I answered your question, really hope Jade would be back. I think I tried to handle it when I, when we were down to the nitty gritty and we were in the final couple weeks and we still hadn't agreed to something. Then it was at the point where I said, okay, well, if you aren't going to stay, I want to give you the best possible exit. And I have only good things to say about Jade. I really enjoyed working with her. She was a great part of AEW. She's always welcome here. I tried to give her the best possible send off I could. The classiest send off I've ever seen in wrestling was at the time, was I thought it wasn't the kind of send off I really saw. And I was 10 years old and I could tell it was different was when Ric Flair left the WWF and he did a, a match with Mr. Perfect, who was a natural person for him to wrestle. And that was it. And then he was gone. They didn't do anything to embarrass him or mess him up or and they let him leave. And he was still Ric Flair. He, he wrestled the match against the person he should have wrestled, finished up and left it, with not only to say the least, not only with his dignity, but in a str probably a better position than he came in. And Let me stop it there. That's a weird match to cite as the classiest send-off. Nothing against it, but if you remember, I think it was the third Monday Night Raw, or it was around that period of time. Yeah. Ric Flair was in WWF. They were going to move him down the card. He had a deal where he can get out of his deal if they did. Vince said, okay. So out of nowhere, his feud of Mr. Perfect, it was, I challenge you to a loser leaves WWF match. And then that match happened the next week. And then Flair was gone. Again, nothing well, against that, but that's not really a classy send-off, is it? But uh, No, but also it was just doing normal course of business. But with Tony, <laughs> there's no comparison between Jane Cargill and Ric Flair. And not in terms of the person, although there's no similarities there, or the talent level, there's no similar similarities there, but the way they were being used and how they had been used and what was going on. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, let's go back. If they'd, have, oh. if they'd have had a loser leave AEW match with Cargill versus X, Y, or Z, it wouldn't have been that memorable because... She'd only been there fucking a couple of years doing squash matches. She wasn't the greatest wrestler in the history of the fucking game. Hey, he definitely took care of her on the way out. You're going to lose and it'll be on Rampage. Yeah. No one's going to see, see it. it. Yeah. I mean, seriously, that is a way of taking care of her. You could have put it on Dynamite. And he should have to get something out of his investment. Let's go back to Tony. And that's what I tried to do. I, you know, I wanted to give her the best possible send off. I think the natural thing was there was no rematch ever against Chris Statlander. So I had her do a run in and lay out Statlander, knowing that it was going to set up the, the match where she would likely finish up unless we came to an agreement at the last minute, which I was really still hoping would happen down to the last minute, to be honest with you. And I'm not, I don't think I'm talking out of school. I have only positive things to say, but that's where it was at. So I thought I had a pretty good plan at that point that, you know, if this is it, that's where we'll finish up. When she did the uh, segment where she returned on Collision to set up her final match the following week on Rampage against Chris Statlander in the main event, and she did the run-in, and Tony Schiavone came up to the desk, tapped on my monitor, and said, you're a classy guy, boss. And I think oh, he boy. meant it. That was a classy way to send her off. And, uh, you know, I, I try to... Uh, make this a great home for wrestlers, and I want people to see whether you're coming in or coming out. We're going to uh, treat you well. Hey, wait a minute. I really it's not a home for wrestlers. It's just a boarding house for wayward wrestlers in transition. They're going to come and they're going to go. They're not going to buy retirement property, Tony. They're going to relocate there while their job it, it necessitates it. And then they're going to move on to greener pastures. Just get that in your head right now. Well, Shivani really figured out how to get in good with Tony Khan a couple of years ago, didn't he? Boy, howdy, did he. Maybe Tony's supplying him with all that hair dye. I love you, Tony, but you're older than me. I can value Jade, so I wanted to give her a good send-off. And like I said, I wish her the best, and she'd always be welcome back if she wanted to come back. Thanks.
I mean, you could argue about various things here. Of course, negotiating till the last minute is never a good idea, and it seems to happen a few times at AEW, but anything wrong with what Tony's saying here? Yes. Yes. Because here's the thing. If she had said, okay, you know what, boss? I'm coming back here. I'll take the deal. Now he's booked her against Statlander. Was he going to change the finish? Or was she going to still do the job? And what's happened with Statlander if she gets beat? Because Jane decided to re-sign. It, no, you don't do this and you don't cater to these people to that extent, especially when they mean nothing in terms of changing the bottom line of your business or your overall ratings or your pay-per-view buys or whatever. It just shows that Tony can be had. And that's what that's the reason why you're starting to hear that a lot of people are looking at, at AEW like a way station. Like, well, they won't give me six or seven figures in the WWF right now, but they sure will in AEW, and then sooner or later I'll end up there anyway if I can just get on TV and prove to them that I'm good, then the WWF will sign me eventually. That's what they're starting to do now. Because this, the gap is widening. Well, we will certainly see what happens with this gap in the weeks ahead. We're going to stop it here, Jim. This is two hours. And I'll, ju I'll just say one more thing. I don't, I wasn't involved in the discussions, obviously. But when she did the original job, who'd she put over? The first Statlander. One? It was Statlander, Statlander both so, times. Statlander. Okay, when she did the original job and it was on Dynamite, then fine. No, it was on a pay-per-view. I think it was on a pay-per-view. It was on the pay-per-view. But they can play it on Dynamite anywhere they, anytime they want because it's their fucking programming. Point is, Statlander beats the undefeated superstar, Jane Cargill, and now Statlander is the champion, and we're going to play that on all the televisions because that gets Statlander over. We get some return on having 72 people or whatever put Cargill over. And now we'll talk about the new contract, and we'd love to have you back. And if you sign a new contract, we'll bring you back and put you on television and start putting you over again. But if you don't, you're already done. And the last time they saw you was getting beat by Chris Statlander, which helps my business. Not, oh golly, after two months, she's taking a break. She still won't sign. I'm going to bring her back and let her beat Statlander up. And then I'm going to have her put Statlander over again on a show that nobody watches. And then she'll be straight into the WWF next week. That didn't make any fucking sense. Do you think from what you know and from what you hear in situations like this that Tony is overly concerned with people? He doesn't want to make anyone unhappy with him. He doesn't want... Anybody to think, well, he screwed me around or he treated me bad, even when he's not. As long as they think that, he takes it seriously. So, no, he, he wants friends. Poor Richie Rich wants friends. And that's been the problem since day one and will continue to be. And I don't know how many times we got to say it, but it's obvious and everybody's talking about it. He, he wants friends. He doesn't want employees. He wants to have fun doing the thing he's always wanted to do. He's not running a business. And when you get $100 million to do whatever the fuck you want to do with, you can do a lot of shit for a while. But sooner or later, there comes a time at some point, you have to start being good at it. I believe we're coming to the point. Maybe we've already got there, and we're starting to see what happens. Well, Jim, this media scrum went two hours and 20 minutes after the pay-per-view, which went hours and hours and hours. And Tony's still wide awake. He's drinking uh, water, it appears. But maybe after an event like this, he's so wired, he's so awake, full of energy still, that he would go back to his hotel. And because he's in a strange land and a strange place, being, uh, you know, Seattle... He doesn't have access to all the shows he usually watches over in England when he's with his football team, football club, I guess. 
Maybe he needs ExpressVPN. I was wondering if you were ever going to get down that road. Well, I'll tell you what he does need. He, besides the fact that he needs someone to watch over him and make sure he doesn't act awkward in public, he also needs a, a subscription to ExpressVPN for exactly the reason you mentioned, because The Office is on UK Netflix, right? Not our office, but their office. The original. They had an office before we had an office. That's It's the original one. The one in America is based on that one. Yeah, but you can't see the, the real deal. All you can see is the ripoff over here. But if you get ExpressVPN and change your location, relocate where you are set at in the world, then you can watch The Office on UK Netflix and nobody will be any the wiser because you can use ExpressVPN to unlock movies and shows that are only available in other countries, not just Netflix. It works with Hulu, with the BBC iPlayer, with YouTube. Wait a minute. People aren't going to be able to zoom us out of money on our YouTube channel with this, are they? No, we should be okay. Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to continue to plug it. Because you can watch anything with Express... Say you love Korean dramas, and who doesn't love a good Korean drama? You can use ExpressVPN to watch Parasite off the South Korea Netflix. But now, wait a minute. I think I've discovered an issue with that. If it's Korean dramas, and it's South Korean Netflix, and they think you're located in South Korea, ain't they going to be speaking South Korean? Well, you always have the options for closed captioning or maybe subtitles. Won't that be in South Korean, too? It doesn't have to be. Maybe, I mean, here in Can America... Can you change that shit? Well, we could change it from English to Spanish to French to German to all sorts of different things on our TVs. Well, I didn't know that. Well, ExpressVPN is even greater than I thought. Well, Folks, no, 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 it's not ExpressVPN. Express it... It'll let you understand any language spoken on Earth. No, that's not You'll what they will do. You'll be able to speak Swahili. You'll no, you be able won't. to speak to the, to the fucking people on Easter Island. You'll be able to speak that ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ooh, 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 language that they speak down at the South Pole. All due to ExpressVPN, it's it's nope. better than the than the the babble. It's better than all these language learning things because you just punch a button and automatically you are speaking and understanding South Korean. No, you will not understand nope. anything language wise that you don't currently understand. But you can access their shows. Well, what good would that if they're do on then? the internet? If you don't understand what they're saying. Because I'm telling you, you got to get the ExpressVPN no, no, no. so that you'll understand all these people talking to you. No, ExpressVPN will supply the facilitation so that you can access the various websites or various things from South Korea. However, those sites themselves would have the closed captioning or the English translation or whatever it may be. Well, never mind. But nevertheless, ExpressVPN <laughs> Express is ridiculously fast. It's positively, obscenely fast. There's never any buffering or lag. You can stream in HD. No problem whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it's so blazingly fast, when you press that button, you got to turn a garden hose on your computer because it's going to just blaze in and set the whole house on fire. And it works on all your devices, phones, media consoles, smart TVs, and so much more. You can watch what you want to watch on your Dick Tracy TV wristwatch or on your big screen. And right now, if you want to get access to hundreds of new shows as well as thousands of new languages, use my link right now, expressvpn.com slash JCE. You're going to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Expressvpn.com slash JCE. You can learn more and you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Now, three, how many TV shows can you watch in three months if you don't go to bed, like Tony? If you don't go to bed, well, Tony has work to do, though, so he can't just sit around and watch TV. He's not staying well, awake and watching TV. He's got the TV on in the background while he's writing all this stuff. It's obvious something is distracting him. So in, in three months, you can watch a lot of TV shows, and you can learn dozens of new languages. So right now, folks, once again, hundreds of shows thousands of languages, three months for free, all these time periods and categories. How can you 
Turn this down, expressvpn.com slash JCE. Do you uh do you speak French, Brian? Voulez-vous Francais? I do not speak French, no. What about German? Achtung, baby! No, fuck the Germans. Well, what did the Germans ever do to you? I'm Jewish. I guess that's something. ExpressVPN.com. Promo code. There we go. There we go. It's not a promo code. It's a slash. It's a slash.